In this lecture, we're going to cover cell division. If we think of the different functions of cell division for organisms on this planet, one of the first functions we can think about is for single cell organisms, division of one cell into two cells leads to reproduction of a whole new organism. This particular diagram is showing you amoeba and at the final division process where one amoeba is divided into two. Another important function of cell division is for growth and development. This happens to sh be showing you the two-cell uh, two stage for um, most likely is a sea urchin embryo. And ultimately, this, these cells will continue to divide to create a ball or blastula cells. And then those cells will then divide and grow to ultimately produce different morphological features of the animal. Another important function of cell division in multicellular organisms is the ability of cells to divide and replenish and repair tissue. This happens to be a section of bone marrow that has different cell types in it and ultimately some cells dividing to produce the different blood to, um, cell types in an animal. So all three of these are important functions of cell division. When we think about kind of the simple steps of cell division. Ultimately a cell needs to grow to duplicate its mass and also duplicate important cellular components such as DNA. So not only will DNA be duplicated, membrane be duplicated so that the cell plasma membrane is much larger and ultimately organelles as well. At the end of this preparation process for growth and duplication of organelles, the DNA will actually be divided by nuclear division. One such way that specific cells divide their nuclear mass is by what's called mitosis. And this is something that happens in animal cells and eukaryotes. Um, division in prokaryotes is actually something termed different, which is called binary fission. So in mitosis, the division of the DNA occurs during this particular type of nuclear division and the, the, the division of the cytoplasm occurs by what's called cytokinesis which you can see here. So ultimately the cell will grow, prepare to divide, the DNA will be divided between two, into two separate masses and the two cells will be cleaved separately into two individual daughter cells um, by cytokinesis in animal cells and also other eukaryotes. Now, for cells to properly prepare for this division process, the division of, of DNA as well as the cytoplasm, cells need to go through sequential phases that are part of what's called the cell cycle. And the cell cycle starts with a cell first going through G1. In G1, which is also known as GAP1, the cell will essentially assess are there proper nutrients for cell division and ultimately are the right signal molecules being received to tell a cell to move forward. If the environment is favorable, the cells will then enter into S phase. And S stands for synthesis phase. And it is this phase that we get DNA duplication. After S phase is complete, meaning the DNA has been properly duplicated, the cells will then enter to G2. G2 is GAP2, and GAP2 is ultimately a phase for additional growth and preparation for the division phase. Once G2 is complete, a cell will then enter M phase, and depending on the cell type, that will either be mitosis or it could also be meiosis if it's involved in sperm formation or egg formation. At the end of, of mitosis, the DNA will be properly divided and two cells will be generated due to cytokinesis. So ultimately, mitosis will occur first, followed by division of the cytoplasm, which is cytokinesis. Now, the length of time it takes for a cell to go all the way through G1, S, G2, and M depends on the cell type. Fast dividing cells in, in 
such as our body, ultimately the fastest they will go through the cell cycle is about 22 to 24 hours. However, there are many cell types that take much longer than the simply 24 hours for cell division. Liver cells take over a year. Some cells may never divide at all. Instead, they actually exit G1 and enter what's called a G0 or pause state, which is what happens to most of our neurons. And more rapidly dividing cells might be something like uh, blood stem cells that result in production of blood. But ultimately, different cell types will have a different cell cycle length that needs to occur for cell division of that particular cell type. Bacteria cells in optimum conditions can actually divide every 20 minutes. However, obviously this length depends on the cell type. Now if a cell is in G1, S, or G2, this is called interphase. And then, once a cell enters M phase, you either say it's a mitotic cell if it's going through mitosis, and meiotic if it's going through meiosis. Now, during the S phase and the duplication of DNA, which occurs in this particular phase, the chromosomes are duplicated. So, this is showing you the two strands of a chromosome. And during S phase, the two strands will actually duplicate so that you end up with two separate chromosomes at the end. The duplication process is due to what's called semi-conservative replication, and the, chroma the two strands will pull apart, and new strands will be built that are complementary to the old strands, and bubble formation, which you're seeing here, allows for those new strands to be synthesized and eventually those bubbles will all join and the DNA will be completely synthesized into two separate DNA chromosomes. So ultimately in humans we have 46 chromosomes. All 46 of those chromosomes will be simultaneously undergoing semi-conservative replication to produce two identical chromosomes at the end of my at the end of S phase. So if we have 46 chromosomes, at the end of S phase we will now have 92. Now, in M phase, when a cell enters into mitosis, these chromosomes go undergo an elaborate packing mechanism to make them smaller and more compact structures, which will enable them to be easier to align and also to segregate or separate into two separate cells. And this condensed structure, what's called the mitotic chromosome structure, is shown here. Then, of course, these two chromosomes will be divided between two separate cells. And then these chromosomes will decondense again in interphase, so transcription can resume, and the whole process happens over and over again. So there's some po important proteins that are used to assist during the S phase of the cell cycle one of which are cohesins, and cohesins are proteins that are produced during the S phase that when these two chromosomes that are identical are produced, these co cohesin proteins will hold them together so that the sister chromatids, these two duplicated chromosomes that are identical, stay together. So this particular mitotic chromosome that you're seeing here has one chromosome and it has an identical duplicate on the other side and they're held together by cohesin proteins and the only time that these cohesin proteins are removed are when we want to actually divide these chromosomes and so that each um, new cell type ends up with one copy. In addition to cohesins that hold sister chromatids together, hold these two duplicated or identical chromosomes together once they're synthesized, we also have important proteins called condensins. And condensins play an important role when the cell enters into mitosis, and they're really going to help fold and pack DNA so that it can form this nice, tight, mitotic chromosome structure needed during the division process. Now, cohesins and condensins appear to be from related protein families. They have some similar sequences, but obviously they have divergent functions in regards to preparation for cell division. In addition to thinking about duplication of chromosomes in S phase, we also need to duplicate centrosomes, or what are also called as um, microtubule organizing centers, MTOCs. These get duplicated actually at the beginning of S phase, and 
they will duplicate, but they will not separate until the onset of, of M phase. So they'll remain together as kind of a single centrosome or microtubule organizing center. Ultimately, these two centrosomes will eventually migrate apart at the onset of M phase or at the beginning of mitosis to form two separate poles of the mitotic spindle. And this is critical for proper alignment and separation of chromosomes. So this, in addition to duplication of DNA for preparation of cell division, we also have to duplicate our centrosomes. Now to look at the, cut, the more molecular structure of a centrosome, centrosomes in animal cells have a pair of what are called centrioles, which are shown here. Surrounding the centrioles are what are called gamma tubulin rings. And gamma tubulin is another type of tubulin. If you remember, alpha and beta tubulin are in microtubules. Gamma tubulin is found in ring structures surrounding the centrosome. Gamma tubulin rings serve as nucleating sites for microtubules to grow from. So they're kind of like seeds in which microtubules will start to grow out of. And you can see these seeds all around the centrioles. So these gamma tubulin rings serve for polymerization sites or growth sites, assembly sites, or nucleation sites, depending on how you want to describe it, for which microtubules will assemble. Two other important features of the cell division process are two important transient cytoskeletal structures. So transient referring to that they're temporary. And one of the first important cytoskeletal structures is the mitotic spindle. And remember, the mitotic spindle, its important function is ultimately DNA alignment plus separation. So ultimately, the mitotic spindle is going to help capture align chromosomes plus help separate those chromosomes to opposite poles so that they are equal sets of chromosomes that end up in each cell. The mitotic spindle, remember, is, is derived from microtubules as well, as well as some other important proteins which you're going to see later in the lecture. And there has to be two poles in which microtubules grow out of to ultimately form this elaborate mitotic spindle. Another temporary or transient cytoskeletal structure that's important in animal cells is formation of the contractile ring. And contract the contractile ring consists mostly of actin and myosin motors and ultimately the contractile ring will decrease in diameter which is due to walking of myosin motors and this will help pinch in the, the membrane of the cell and lead to cytoplasmic cleavage. So this is a, con a transient structure we see in animal cells. It's not the same, it is not a structure we see in plant cells, but we do see in animal cells. And ultimately it's transient because it's going to be important for cytokinesis. Okay, so once a cell has gone through G1, S, G2, Obviously, chromosomes are duplicated, centrosomes are duplicated, the cells prepare to divide. Then a cell will enter into M phase. And one type of M phase is mitosis. And these are the stages of mitosis. The end result of cells undergoing mitosis is the two daughter cells at the end will ultimately be identical to one another. They're essentially clones of the original cell. So ultimately, if we need to make new skin, new blood, etc., a cell will undergo mitosis to produce new cells. Or if we have a wound and we need to regenerate new tissue at a wound site, cells will be stimulated to divide by mitosis to produce identical new cells for a particular organism. Or if it's a eukaryotic cell, such as an amoeba, to produce new identical cells of that organism, a, a amoeba will go through mitosis to do so. Now remember, a cell will, will go through all the specific phases of the cell cycle interphase, so G1, S, G2, and then enter the first phase of mitosis. And the first phase of mitosis is called prophase. 
The second phase of mitosis is called prometaphase. The third phase of mitosis is metaphase. The fourth phase of mitosis is anaphase. The fifth phase of mitosis is telophase, and that will be followed by cytokinesis. The first phase of mitosis, prophase, has two important events. The first event that needs to happen is the formation of the mitotic spindle. And the second is condensation of the chromosomes, which just means condensing or packing of chromosomes into that mitotic chromosome shape. Now, for formation of the spindle, there are some key events that need to happen. The first is the interphase array of microtubules will completely disassemble. After the disassembly of that mitotic spindle, the centrosomes will actually start to migrate apart as chromosomes start to grow to generate the new mitotic spindle. One of the important key events to formation of the mitotic spindle is changes in proteins called MAPs or microtubule associated proteins. These proteins normally bind to the surface of microtubules and help stabilize some of the microtubules so they can't grow and shorten, grow and shorten. What happens is, is these MAPs actually become phosphorylated and they no longer can bind very well to the microtubules and this leads to actually increase microtubule dynamics, meaning that they start to grow and shorten at a much faster rate. This increased dynamics is actually critical for formation of the spindle and also for capturing of chromosomes during prophase. These steps are essentially showing you the stages to formation of the mitotic spindle. The microtubules completely disassemble and ultimately will start to once again regrow from these two poles, which you can see here. They first start to form kind of what are called aster microtubules. They just start to have short microtubules growing out. And what starts to happen is some microtubules will grow out and they will start to connect between poles. And ultimately how they connect between poles are with the presence of a special motor protein called interpolar mo motors. They will help bind to these microtubules and connect them together so the two poles become a single unit. They become a mitotic spindle. And you can see that there will be several interpolar connections or connections between microtubules that are formed from both poles that now interact. They don't directly interact, but they interact through binding of specific motors. In addition to these interpolar sections forming, which we call interpolar microtubules because they are forming the, an interpolar connection, we also have what are called aster microtubules, which are out towards the cell periphery, which help kind of orient the spindle. And we also end up with microtubules that are going to grow and shorten that will capture chromosomes. We call these kinetochore microtubules. So there will be three types of microtubules that become important in formation of the spindle. Aster microtubules, interpolar microtubules which connect the two poles together via motor proteins, and also kinetochore microtubules which are going to grow and shorten, grow and shorten, and ultimately help to capture a line and separate chromosomes. Now these interpolar motors, when they bind to these interpolar microtubules, they can actually motor towards the plus ends, which remember the plus ends are sticking out in this orientation. And when they do so, it actually helps to push the poles apart so that the spindle can expand, which is needed for mitosis to occur properly. Now, in addition to formation of the mitotic spindle and the important elaborate events that we saw where we first 
have to regrow microtubules from separate poles. The poles need to separate, and this is assisted by motor proteins. And then we also need to obviously expand and then allow for rapid growing microtubules to help connect to chromosomes. We also have condensation of chromosomes. So chromosomes will need to be packed into these nice, dense, smaller structures so we can segregate them appropriately to two separate cells. This is highlighting the extensive packing that occurs to these chromosomes. And remember, condensins and other types of proteins, such as histones, will ultimately help mediate the packing of a chromosome. And just to give you an idea how packed that structure is, it's actually 10,000-fold shorter than its normal extended length. Once these chromosomes are condensed, a really important structure assembles onto the chromosomes, and these are kinetochores. Condensed chromosomes, we have two of them, which are called sister chromatids each. They're both duplicated chromosomes. So this is called a sister chromatid. And this is also a sister chromatid. And what happens, that special centromeric DNA, which is kind of near the middle of each duplicated chromosome, there will be assembly of specific proteins onto this special centromeric DNA. And these proteins will assemble to generate what's called Kinetochores, and each of these duplicated sister chromatids will end up with a kinetochore. Kinetochores are an assembly of these groups of proteins which will assist in attachment to microtubules so that ultimately these chromosomes will be able to lock into these microtubules so that they can align and properly segregate later in the division process. This kinetochore formation occurs when the chromosomes con condense in prophase. Okay, so what is our next phase of mitosis? Prometaphase. And prometaphase is marked by two important events, which are shown here. One of which, prior in prophase, there was no breakdown of the nuclear envelope. So ultimately in prometaphase, the nuclear envelope will start to, to break down which will then allow microtubules of the mitotic spindle to start to, to interact with kinetochores of these duplicated chromosomes. Now, for the nuclear envelope to break down, the key event is the nuclear lamina will get phosphorylated. Ultimately, this leads to disassembly of the nuclear envelope, which you can see here in this diagram the fragmentation of the nuclear envelope. And at this point in time, the kinetochore microtubules will be able to grow and shorten, grow and shorten, and start to attach to condensed chromosomes. Now, in humans, we actually have 20 to 40 microtubules that need to attach to the kinetochores of each side of the condensed chromosome, so it needs to have 20 to 40 microtubules that connect to the kinetochores of each sister chromatid. This particular diagram is highlighting the kinetochore of this particular chromosome. So ultimately the two main events in prometaphase is nuclear envelope breakdown and ultimately the microtubules will then start to connect to chromosomes to help lead to the process of alignment, which happens in metaphase. So metaphase is always defined by alignment. So these chromosomes will be attached to kinetochores, which will then allow for attachment to microtubules. And ultimately, once microtubules plug into both sides of the kinetochore and both sides of the spindle, ultimately the microtubules will grow and shorten, grow and sh shorten on either side to really help play a tug of war to help bring the chromosomes to the middle of the plate. So you can imagine these chromosomes oscillating back and forth towards one pole or the other 
And ultimately what allows them to reach a middle point is kind of like playing tug of war. There has to be equal number of microtubules on either side that they pull them equally so that when they're pulling back and forth from the pole that they have equal pressure and they land right in the middle. This is ultimately what's going to happen for all the sets of duplicated chromosomes for them to properly align. So metaphase, its hallmark is these chromosomes have equal tension and reach all at the metaphase plate. This particular cell is a beautiful aminofluorescence picture showing chromosomes all aligned at the metaphase plate. And the chromosomes are stained with a dye called DAPI, which is blue, and there's actually a protein that's, that's tagged with a red fluorescent protein that allows for identification of kinetochores of these duplicated chromosomes. And they know that tension, proper tension or equal tension from either side due to the connection of kinetochore microtubules to the chromosomes is important because if they sever the microtubules on one side of the one sister chromatid, the chromosome will actually rapidly move towards the other pole like it's being pulled. So if you were to all of a sudden, you're in a tug of war with equal people on either side of a rope, if you were to all of a sudden one side to drop, you would all fall towards the opposite direction, which is exactly what happens with the chromosomes if, they pro if the microtubules are severed on one side. So they do believe it's a tension or tug of war of tension that really helps align the chromosomes at the metaphase plate. Now, after alignment is achieved, anaphase can begin. So only if true alignment is achieved, then a cell will enter into anaphase. And this is due to activation of a complex called APC, which is also defined as anaphase promoting complex. So if alignment is achieved, like this picture, the APC will be activated which will lead to separation of sister chromatids to opposite poles. Now one of the jobs of the APC is it's thought to actually cleave or help mediate a step to cleave cohesins. So its activity will actually lead to activation of an enzyme that will cut the cohesins and when the cohesins are cut those sister chromatids will bounce apart and that will start the process of moving them to opposite directions. So in this case, one sister chromatid is going this way and another sister chromatid is going the opposite way and that would be true for all duplicated chromosome pairs. Now anaphase is actually split into two separate parts. Anaphase A and anaphase B. In anaphase B, it's defined as movement of sister chromatids to opposite poles which is shown here. Now, this is due obviously first to cutting of the cohesin so the chromosomes can bounce apart and also it's due to depolymerization of these kinetochore microtubules meaning they're going to disassemble to help draw those sister chromatids to opposite poles. In anaphase B, anaphase B is where you see pushing apart of the spindle poles. So the spindle actually becomes elongated. So you can see the difference in the spindle length from this picture to this picture. So ultimately the spindle elongates. And the important events that happen in anaphase B is these interpolar microtubules which are held together by interpolar motors which are shown in the black dot. These motor proteins will walk towards the plus end and actually push the poles further apart. This is important because it helps elongate the cell. An elongated cell is much easier to divide than a nicely round cell. So spindle elongation really just helps set the cell up for division into two separate cells. So anaphase is separated into anaphase A and anaphase B. And you can ultimately see there's two important events. In anaphase A, you're getting depolymerization of those kinetochore microtubules after cohesins are clipped. 
to help draw sister chromatids to opposite pole. And in anaphase B, the spindle is elongated due to motoring of these interpolar micro motor proteins on interpolar motor microtubules to help push the poles apart. And also, these interpolar microtubules have to grow at the same time as the motors are motoring to really help make the spindle elongated. So to give you an idea about how motors play a role in mitosis, this is showing you the interpolar motors. You can see that they walk both on one microtubule and also the other that they're connecting to. They walk towards the plus ends and that will help lead to spindle elongation during the beginning phases of, the, of mitosis as well as during anaphase B. We also have motors at the kinetochore. And during anaphase A, when those sister chromatids are moving towards opposite poles and these microtubules are depolymerizing, the motors walk faster than the, mo than the microtubules are actually depolymerizing so that the chromosomes stay tethered to the microtubules as they move to opposite poles. So ultimately we have motor proteins that are critical for mitosis. They help capture chromosomes, move chromosomes during anaphase A, and they also help elongate the spindle during the beginning stages of mitosis as well as anaphase B. Now after anaphase, we have telophase. And telophase is ultimately where we have these separate masses of DNA and nuclear envelopes are going to start to form around these separated masses. This is triggered by dephosphorylation of the lamins. If you remove the phosphorylation of the lamins, they will actually start to reassemble into the nuclear envelope and the nuclear lamina to help allow for formation of this envelope surrounding our two separate masses of DNA. In addition to reformation of the nuclear envelope, we also have chromosome decondensation or the chromosomes unpack and this allows for chromosomes once again to be their information to be read so ultimately transcription can resume so we can assume our production of proteins which is needed continually except for obviously in the division phase. Following telophase, we now have these separated masses of DNA that now have nuclei formed around them. We then need to divide the cytoplasm. And in animal cells, this is done by cytokinesis and specifically cytokinesis is mediated by the contractile ring. The contractile ring is made up of, of rings of actin filaments they have motor proteins that walk on those filaments. Remember the actin ring is going to be just under the membrane inside the cell and the ring is going to stretch the entire membrane in a circle in the middle of the cell. And what happens is, is myosin will start motoring on the rings and the rings will get smaller in diameter such that you'll get tightening of the middle of the cell in so the membrane gets pulled in or ruffled in. And the reason why as this ring gets smaller and smaller, there's proteins that attach to the actin and also attach to the membrane. So the membrane gets pulled in as that ring gets smaller and that's why we get this furrowing or ruffling, which is why a lot of times cytokinesis is described as cleavage furrow formation. So you can see this ruffling in a dividing frog egg. Now it will continue to ruffle and form a tighter, tighter ring structure so that the cells ultimately start to um, di divide membrane-wise into two separate cells. So this next picture shows a fur further a cell that's in further cytokinesis and you can see that there's very little membrane left between the two and the, ultimately this ring structure will help draw and pinch these cells into two. Eventually they'll pull apart. This diagram is actually showing you what is the material that's left in the membranes between these two cells and you'll see remnants of the, uh, this, the ring structure 
the contractile ring, as well as remnants of some of the, the interpolar microtubules that were part of the mitotic spindle. So eventually these will two cells will pinch apart into two and at the end of mitosis you're left with two identical cells which we call daughter cells and ultimately they're identical in DNA content and identical to the original cell. So if there were 46 chromosomes in a, the cell to start then there will be 46 chromosomes in the cell cells at the end in both cells. Now this is just a fun picture to ultimately highlight some different for, for fluorescently labeled cells that were undergoing mitosis. So they're mitotic cells. And you can kind of try to try to start to guess based on the orientation of the spindle. The spindle is shown in green and the, the tubulin is actually labeled with a green fluorescent antibody, which is why you can see the mitotic spindle in green. And the chromosomes are labeled with DAPI, which is fluorescent blue, and you can see the different, some of the different phases of the cell cycle. So in, in this particular slide that I'm showing you first here, it looks like chromosomes have already aligned and they're actually just barely starting cyto um, anaphase because you're starting to see a little bit of separation. In this particular diagram it looks like this could be early telophase. We have our two separated masses of DNA at two se separate centrosomes and ultimately they look like they're starting to decondense and most likely the nuclear envelope is reforming. In this particular diagram here these cells look like they're in later anaphase, but if you notice, there's actually a set of or chromosomes that don't seem to make it to either end. Now, if this happens and you have unequal separation, this cell is considered an aneuploidy cell, and this is where the resulting cells at the end of this process will end up with unequal amounts of chromosomes, and this poten potentially can lead to cells that have higher or lower number of chromosomes which can be detrimental to the cell. If something like this were to happen in the division process for eggs or sperm, this could lead to major gen genetic defects of a potential fertilized egg later down the road. This particular cell looks like it's actually in the early stages of telophase, um, potentially end of anaphase, where you look like you've, we've got separated masses of chromosomes to poles, However, we haven't really allowed for complete separation yet. So these are just some examples of cells and what you'd see visually if you were looking at a dividing cell live underneath the microscope, in this case dividing cells that were labeled with fluorescent tags, which allows us to actually see DNA in the mitotic spindle at a much better view. So my suggestion is, which will be also part of your module assignment, is that you draw out cells in each of the phases of mitosis. You make sure you label all important parts and that you describe the key events in each phase so that you know what happens in all the stages of mitosis and that you visually can see this process. And this will be part of your assignment for your next module and you'll turn this in when we meet next.